I wrote 12 chapters, including the one with Aaron, and then I wrote the, the final chapter, which is the introduction of like, what is the definition of reasoning? And, and from a, I try to incorporate a brain-based perspective in here, and it's really three parts. Um, it's many inputs leading to one output, right? So there's something there about you gotta you know, take in the world and do an action, right? Mm -hmm. Or have at least a conclusion out of it. That's one really important feature. You can go through it in many steps. It's not a reflex. It's not a, it's not a you do this, I do that. We go through a chain of events within the nervous system to lead to one to the one conclusion, right? And there's not one way to do it. Right. Um, and then the third part of the definition is uh, it has to combine new and old information. Um, welcome to another episode of the Mind Medicine Podcast. My name is Bram McCartney, the host of this podcast and the chief vulnerability officer and founder of Mission 38. Um, it's fitting that the first episode of this new podcast with a guest is with Dr. Daniel Krozik, who is the deputy director of the Center for Brain Health at UT Dallas. Um, just a very, very um, intelligent man, right? And so we're super, super excited to have you on today to um, educate our listeners all about neuroscience, um, brain health, um, decision making, all, all these things, and I'm super excited to, to have this conversation today. Yeah, I've had a diverse career. I'm happy to talk about a whole variety of topics. Thanks for having me on, Brian. Yeah, man, absolutely. Um, again, I think it's fitting that, you know, in the past, most of our conversations have been about people um, who have learned about mental illness and mental health and depression, anxiety, and suicidal ideation um, the hard way, right? Which is, uh, you know, a lot of the times um, how that happens, right? Mental health and you know, mental illness and, and brain health isn't really the, the forefront in your in your mind or, or in your life until you either go through it or you know someone who has. Yeah, um, and it, these issues touch everybody at some point in their life. It's just a matter of, of when. And mm -hmm. um, I think they are, you, you never stop learning about the, these topics and the human mind in general. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's it's the one thing that every human can relate on, right, is, um, is suffering and especially internal battles. Uh, it's not something that you can really you can really escape. So, you know, why don't you kind of walk through your history, right? How did you become a neuroscientist? Where did you um, get your formal education in? And then kind of take us through the journey thus far. Yeah, happy to do so. So I, I came from a family of teachers. Both my parents were teachers and literally every relative was a teacher. Mm. So we were all, they were all in education, but pr pretty much at the elementary school through high school level. And I had a, kind of enough exposure to that to have a sense that I, I really had a, like a value placed on education just growing up that way. Um, that said, I wasn't like the star of my high school at all. You know, like academically, I was not, I really didn't hit my stride at that, at that stage of my life. I was just, just immature. Mm -hmm. um, and I was growing up in the Buffalo, New York area just for context. And uh, I went to college go Bills. at, uh, yes, go Bill. Absolutely. <laughs> um, Bill's fan for life. <laughs> um, the, uh, yeah, you, can, you can bond over, you know, right. these, oh, yeah. these uh, shared um, fixations. But, um, but yes, I grew up with the, the Buffalo Winters. And I went to college at a school called Fredonia State, which is part of the uh, state university system in New York. And it, it's about 5,000 students. And that was what I was ready for at the time. It was actually in a village in, in Western New York State. And it was there that I really found uh, this passion for uh, the mind, you know, mm -hmm. the human mind. And that was what it was really about. I had, a, I had the good fortune of like a really good friend of mine who's my roommate. Um, we would have these really intensive conversations, classic dorm room conversations about you know, the meaning of life, like, you know, what's, what's society about? And it really was a, a fantastic sort of um, moment to, to just, I, I knew I wanted to focus on something that would be meaningful. And I was looking for a way to explore really the meaning of life and, and through the human mind and, and the brain. And so I, I switched after my freshman year from being a, 
I was going to be a business major. What I didn't know what that even meant. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> but I, 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 I don't think a lot of people still know what it means. Yeah, so I, I switched to psychology, and I, I, I did a minor in biology. And um, at the time, it was in the late 1990s, there was a lot of research in the animal model world, you know, so so like rat and mouse models of everything and, and mm -hmm. genetics research was beginning to happen at that time. There was a lot of enthusiasm for the Human Genome Project. And so I was around some of that. Um, and in psychology itself, you really have two two divisions. There's the clinical division, which is kind of goes back to Sigmund Freud, right? Mm -hmm. It's like we're going to have counseling. We're going to talk over um, something about uh, your mental health or your life and try to improve it. And then there's the research arm of psychology, which is more, um, if, you, if you know B.F. Skinner, sort of the behaviorist tradition of like really careful learning-based experiments that are very evidence-based. But, but Can you give an example to the listeners of, of what an example of that um, research might look like or that, that um, yeah, like that, that clinical trial would look like? Yeah, yeah. So if you think of um, like, Ivan Pavlov is one of the most famous behaviorists. Yep. Like you, a dog salivates around food. It's just it's what it does. It's like preparing for the food, natural sort of response. And what Pavlov showed was with the bell, you know, with a tuning fork or bell, you can you can make the, the dog salivate in response to just the predictor of the reward, right? And so those kind of careful experiments have shown. Um, and they're so important for neuroscience because so much of the brain is about prediction. The, you know, the, the reward circuitry of the brain um, will map itself to the predictor for the reward, not the reward itself. And that's a really key insight. Right. And also the brain takes into account errors. So when we're wrong, like when we predicted a reward, it wasn't delivered, it's learning time, right? And, and a whole variety of things happen at the level of the brain when you go into learning mode. And that really just getting back to the, the story. So there's this, this line of investigation that grew out of the behaviorist tradition. And um, that really is still vibrant within academic psychology. There's the research side of things, and then there's the clinical side. And so um, that was kind of my, my undergraduate education was all in um, un trying to understand the mind. I, I just made it really um, my project to try to get as much uh, background in like social psychology and cognitive psychology as I could, learning about memory and like the, the social dynamics of persuasion. And um, I found all that stuff fascinating. I also found it really fascinating in biology. So the second part of that was the biological, which I was really fascinated by. So three of my favorite classes were animal behavior. It was a class all about you know, um, gazelles, you know, on the savannah do this behavior around lions. Why do they do that? You know, mm -hmm. and there's like a story behind it. Evolution was a course, and this was a brilliant course of like taking the uni what we know about the universe, you know, just from the Big Bang onward. Right. We didn't even get to like the evolution of, of mammals until like, you know, the end of the class because we, we spent so much time learning about the history of life and then zoology, you know, mm -hmm. just sort of the biology of mammals. Um, I really felt like that grounded me with like the background of what the brain does, you know, because you can always ask the question, like, why do we, ha why do we have this huge brain, right. you know, and, and it's the key to everything, but like, what is the brain as an organ, right? The heart is a pump, you know, your, your leg muscles are like a piston, like a hydraulic system for moving you. What is the brain? And so um, I think it's really important to be driven by those kind of questions. You know, mm -hmm. what, what is the value of a big brain for mammals? And we're not alone. You know, it's like elephants have enormous brains, killer whales, chimpanzees. And you find these complex species, and they tend to be social species. It's not accidental that we spend so much time thinking about each other. You know, that's, that's one of the major areas of focus for the brain as we, we live in social groups. And that's, have, that's so key. I have a question for you because it's, people say this all the time, like we know 10% of the brain, right? Is there validity in that statement or how much do we actually know about the brain? How much do we know? Um, not enough for sure. So, so the idea that we use 10% of the brain, I, I think originated from the fact that you can damage the brain. You can have like fairly 
major brain damage, and yet you can still find relatively preserved functioning. So one of the most famous examples was Phineas Gage, who was this railroad worker in the 1800s. I always teach about this in my class. He actually had a, a tamping iron, you know, a bar that was about four feet long and about um, three inches in diameter blown through his forehead. Um, amazingly, Phineas Gage walked around and could still speak and actually even live for another 10 years or so. And so and it, was it was an incredibly devastating injury. A lot of the brain was impaired. And, and yet you would see uh, that a lot of the, the functions of the mind and brain would still, it, it wasn't the same. Right, I mean, he, had, he had impulsivity he had problems. Yeah, he was yeah. a frontal patient yeah, right. you know, the rest of his life. Um, he had impulsivity and emotional control problems, but he wasn't like unable to speak and he wasn't unable to act um, appropriately in any situation. Um, so I think that was kind of where the, the legend grew of like, you didn't actually need all of your brain, like right. you only needed some percentage of it. And also the brain does a lot of time sharing. Um, so we have, now we think in networks. So the, the modern view of the brain is that everything is, all these cells are networked and whole networks are involved in things. And there's kind of signatures for each network. Like there's a dorsal attention network. When you're vigilant, that seems to be elevated and it's um, like a set of brain areas. Similarly, we have what's known as the task network, which is kind of my favorite uh, brain network. And the task network gets engaged when we focus our attention. So like on this conversation, if, if, if I say anything interesting to you, you can perk up mm -hmm. and you, you get attentive. That's your task mode network. So the brain does a lot of this sort of time sharing, but it's billions of neurons and they're connected densely, you know, densely interconnected. So there's so much uh, terrain to cover. There's more than <laughs> more than many, many lifetimes right. sci scientists so, that will work on this. So, um, you know, the other thing people hear all the time is that, you know, the, the brain is one of the most complicated systems or networks in the universe. Do you agree with that statement? Well, in the known universe, right, for sure, course, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, yeah. that's another thing you sort of say. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, you know, I, I often wonder, like, as a thought experiment, what if intelligent aliens landed? Mm -hmm. Like, would, they'd be great scientists of the human condition because they'd have objectivity. So, I mean, that's another conundrum or, or odd, odd feature of, like, being a human studying the human brain. You're kind of like, you're part of the system that you're studying. Um, so just getting on with the story, like I, I was fortunate enough to do my PhD at a time when um, functional brain imaging had come along. So this is using MRI technology and you can actually track activity associated with someone doing a memory task, someone reacting to faces, somebody um, you know processing emotions. And you can get a sense of the related brain activity, not just the area, but also the networks. And so I went to UCLA and really quickly realized uh, what in the world was I doing coping with Northeast winters. Right, <laughs> you know, right, my, right. my first winter in LA, I was like studying for my stats final in 72 degree weather. So um, I kind of yeah, became a Southern Buffalo, California. Yeah, yeah. yeah, still a Bills fan, but yeah, right, I, was, right, I got right. used to the weather. Well, my Rams left to California, so that's why I'd Oh, yeah, it's, it's brutal. Yes. It is no. brutal. Okay. So yeah, um, you're, so you're at UCLA. So uh, I, yes. And that was in part due to excellent mentors. So that's a really key thing in life is having great mentors. So Nancy G was my, um, undergrad research mentor and Nancy's one of the greatest people I've ever known. I mean, she was just, um, she was enthusiastic and interesting and brilliant. And I took every class I could from her and we studied human memory. And in doing that, I, I got my first exposure to real research studies where you get, um, you know, people into a lab environment and you control all of the words they're going to remember. You know the characteristics of the words. You do everything in a very controlled manner. And I really took to that. I could appreciate how that would give you a level of evidence that was in many ways superior to just observations and like, you know, just kind of winging it based, you know, making conclusions based on a, a one-off situation. Um, so I like the scientific method quite a lot, this idea that you would do a controlled experiment, you would try to repeat it and you would do statistics on it. 
um, something about that really resonated with me, that this was a different kind of evidence that would really lend, lend itself to progress. And so Nancy was immensely helpful in getting me going. And that's actually one of the reasons I didn't go into clinical psychology. So everybody who's a psychology major thinks they want to be a clinical psychologist because that's the job, right? That's what we think of, that's what we're exposed to when we're young is like, mm. you're a psychologist. That means you, you do counseling. Um, and I considered doing counseling, but I uh, really was so attracted to the, this uh, application of scientific method and understanding the role of the brain in the mind. And so um, it was a wonderful time to be a PhD student. It's a hard thing to be a PhD student. It's five years, maybe six years. You're just like in this little weird area of life where you don't make any money and like you're surrounded by all these ideas no one thinks about outside of universities and and medical centers and and it was just a, it was a wonderful program keith holyoke was my other great mentor from ucla uh studying human reasoning and i was attracted to that approach because reasoning sounded amazing to me like if we could connect reasoning to biology and the brain then i mean that that i was all in for that and so I got to do a lot of really, really interesting work at UCLA with Keith and colleagues there. And I learned an awful lot. And that kind of set me on my path toward being a higher cognition researcher. Higher cognition is what we call things like reasoning, decision making, mm. even, even things like meditation might be higher cognition. Whereas lower cognition would be like, if, if a loud noise went off, we would both orient to it helplessly. You right. know? So the brain has this capacity for both the higher mental functions actually controlling our thoughts, our behaviors, purposeful, intentional kinds of things, all the stuff we find amazing. And then it also has all these, it's built on all these lower level circuits that are reflexive and automatic in the way they respond. Absolutely, yeah. So first of all, thank you for breaking that down and doing it in a way I think that, I think, you know, things that like your podcast, things like Dr. Huberman, right? Neuroscience for the first time in history, right? People can have access to it. The gap that we now have to fill is like, how do people understand it, right? In a way that that um, is relatable to them and makes sense to them. Um, so I love, you know, your your examples that 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 you have. And it's like, I, earlier what I said, I was like, I think I, I said clinical trials referring, referring to research trials, right? So I didn't know the difference between clinical and research, right, and the um, kind of going into being a counselor, like what that looks like compared to the research side of things. So thank you for for, for breaking all that down. Yes, welcome to my subculture. Yeah, yeah <laughs> of course. All these yeah. different layers, right, just like right, you could right. tell me about military culture, yeah, I talk, sports I said, culture. I said all the time, I'm I'm getting my PhD from the streets. So uh, yeah, it's, learning it from you from uh, from 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 brilliant people like you. So um, man, why don't you walk us through? Kind of obviously, you've done so much in your you know 20 plus year. Um, you know, studying and and teaching. Why don't you walk us through your two books? Um, kind of the the overview of each one, and then maybe a couple of takeaways from from each one as well. Yeah, I'm happy to do so. Actually, I was just thinking it's about it's 25 years since I uh, kind of got into this field. Mm -hmm. um, I you know finished college and and started at UCLA, and um, it all kind of built toward. Um, a joint understanding of like our psychology, the way we think, the way we make decisions, but but mapping it all back onto the biology of the brain. Right. Like that was that was just fascinating to me. That whenever you could find a link to the brain, it would give you so much insight because um, you know we we are mammals, and there's like there are other, you know, um, if you just think of any other mammal, like a dog or. Or a cat. I mean, they, they, they're sophisticated. Right? They have. You can clearly see they have emotions and they have approach behavior and avoidant behavior. And humans like build all of these complex stories and narratives on top of that. We have this massive amount of cortex, which is basically the outer covering of the brain. So the cortex is all the cell bodies, the electrically active neuron um, elements are within the the gray matter. So um, I I ultimately uh, after studying reasoning for about you know close to 20 years i decided i'll write a book you know because there wasn't really a book that addressed reasoning from the perspective of the brain so mm -hmm. it's called reasoning the neuroscience of how we think um it's a little bit of an intimidating title to most people because neuro neuroscience is in there which if you're not a neuroscientist that's like well i don't i don't quite 
know how, what he means there. Um, and what it really was, I, I, it's 13 chapters uh, going all the way from the history of psychology. So I talk a lot about just what we talked about, sort of that behaviorist tradition and ver various uh, legendary scholars in the field and what they contributed leading up to the, the modern times. And uh, we, you know, we cover so much in there. It's uh, animal reasoning. So Aaron Blaisdell from UCLA is a colleague of mine who, who helped with that animal reasoning chapter. He's a brilliant sort of behaviorist type researcher doing, doing really interesting work in other mammal nervous systems. And um, scaling up into um, topics like reasoning about cause and effect, using analogies, how we decide, and then finishing off really with the role of technology in reasoning, which is everywhere. So, I mean, I that tap chapter I could rewrite every six months, and right. it'd be a new chapter so, at this point. So, when you say reasoning, is that is that are you talking about in the way that like why do we think what we think, or like why do we make decisions? Is that kind of the definition of reasoning? Ah, uh, you got to define it. So that actually was what I I wrote. 12 chapters, including the one with Aaron. And then I wrote the, the final chapter, which is the introduction of like, what is the definition of reasoning? And, and from a, I try to incorporate a brain-based perspective in here. And it's really three parts. Um, it's many inputs leading to one output, right? So there's something there about, you gotta you know, take in the world and do an action, right? Mm -hmm. Or have at least a conclusion out of it. That's one really important feature. You can go through it in many steps. It's not a reflex. It's not, a, it's not a, you do this, I do that. We go through a chain of events within the nervous system to lead to one to the one conclusion, right? And there's not one way to do it. right? Um, and then the third part of the definition is uh, it has to combine new and old information. Or at least if it's going to be all old information, it has to be combined in some new way. Because otherwise it's just memory, right? I wanted to differentiate it from pure memory, because if you just recall a memory, you're not making an inference and reasoning has inferences. We, we conclude something new. And so uh, it's an ambitious project, I think, with one's career to, to engage in that. And it's taken me down a whole bunch of different directions. I'm happy to talk about a variety of them, yeah. but I would say that the one thing that really holds my career together is I'm interested in those, those daily life functions, those complex things that people do and the, the neurobiology behind it. Mm. Can you define kind of what some of those complex things that people could do might be? Because, so I think, I think um, correct me if I'm wrong, the kind of the way I'm envisioning is like, you know, with your internal dialogue, right? Like, like um, this morning, right? You wake up, should I get out of bed? You start making excuses, right? On why you should sleep in and how you feel tired. And then, you know, you're like, well, I should get up because I'll be more productive. And like, that's all, is that all reasoning? Well, it's reasoning built on some of the automatic systems. So we have this thing, the reticular activating system. How's that for a great term? The no, reticular I, activating system is no, what yeah. I, I learned about. It's like yeah. the waking circuits. Sounds like a dinosaur or something. Yeah, I mean, it's just the waking circuits. Like right. a dog has a reticular activating system. It's, it's a brainstem um, based responding. So we have circadian rhythms. And um, throughout the day, you know, we're helpless to avoid those, right? There are going to be times, like the morning is a good time to get a lot of your harder intellectual work done just because you have more energy typically. Engaging with the meaning of life at 1130 at night is maybe not the best time. <laughs> you know, cause yeah, it depends how many drinks you have, but yeah, yeah but of course. Right. <laughs> I mean, it depends. Uh, yeah, the state of mind is every, the context is everything. But uh, I do think um, what you talked about, an internal monologue, um, I mean, that's unique to people as far as we know, like defining language, you know, other species communicate and they communicate in a whole variety of ways. And we have, we have communication with, um, those same primal features. So like looking confident, you posture, mm -hmm. you know, just your body language, your, your gaze, like those communicate things. And then of course, language is built onto it. And I think, you know, with, with the human brain, um, we really do think in narratives, like everything is a story to us and we kind of make up a story. And sometimes we actually make up a story that's like fiction. <laughs> you know, we tell ourselves a lot of fictions. Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, just imagine you, you um, find yourself in a situation where 
you don't really like somebody that you're talking with and you can't put a finger on it. It's just there's something about this person that they don't seem trustworthy. They don't read as trustworthy to you. And usually you'll, you'll kind of come up with a reason you don't really like them, but you don't know why. It's probably just something in your brain, mm. you know, the social circuits of our brain can read signals of trust or deception, and they're very hard to explain, but we're gonna come up with a story. So um, part of reasoning is you know, using your intuition. And then part of it, I think, is the mental horsepower to sort of chug through the operations. And that's often what we do voluntarily. What I call the task mode is we get into this brain state where we're ready to do the math problem now. We're gonna you know, lock off distractions and get the work done. But we constantly lapse into these sort of intuitive moments where just the world's telling us something and we can't quite tell even where that signal comes from. Mm -hmm. And that's again, the mammal brain that we share with so many other species. I mean, they have mammal brains too. We just build so much cortex on top of it in narratives and language and explanation, all those things. Absolutely. Yeah, that that is starting to make a lot more sense. Um, you know, and looking at I was going to talk about this later, but it kind of makes sense to talk about it now, I think, talking about, um, you know, mental health, mental illness, and kind of the things that you just decided, right? I think, um, you know, fiction can go both ways, right? It can say, you know, why, you know, I don't like this, like, I feel like I don't like this person. Let me, let me, you know, um, kind of create this, this reason that isn't necessarily reality and why I don't like this person, but that's the same thing with, I feel like, anxiety, depression, right? Thought loops, um, you know, um, for my personal example, depression, like I was so self-deprecating, right? Other people would tell me reality, which is like, or what, what they deemed to be reality of me, which is that I was a good person. And like, um, you know, I, I, um, you know, I have been doing things for other people, et cetera, et cetera. But in my own depressed mind, I was like, no, you're a piece of shit. Like, you know, um, and just making up lies, right. And listening to those lies and, and viewing those lies as reality. So does that, I mean, is that, kind of makes sense in the in the terms of, of your research on kind of what you talked about? Well, I mean, it's a it's a really deep topic because depression has an anxiety. Depression and anxiety are often yeah, of course. interrelated. And it, and it is a major, major problem, especially, I mean, I feel like in society now, people talk about um, younger adults have just tremendous anxiety and adolescents have tremendous anxiety and uncertainty about things. And maybe it's just something about the context of the way they're growing, you know, just growing up nowadays. Um, you're of a, of a younger generation than I am. And, uh, you know, so much of society is just electronic information coming at us and it's almost not real in a sense. Real in, in the way that you and I are talking right now. We could shake hands, we can look each other in the eye. There's a lot of important stuff going on in our brains mm -hmm. because we're here in person, right? That's why COVID sucked. It was like right, virtual yeah, meetings right, yeah, just, and why, and just didn't have it. Yeah. You know, even the eye contact is just something that's so important. And it plays upon a lot of the, the information seeking circuits of the brain. And uh, I think when you study the brain in the way I have, I'm called a cognitive neuroscientist. So um, you have like, uh, that's different than a, a behavioral neuroscientist. So a behavioral neuroscientist traditionally is gonna study animals in the way they create memories or the way they respond in some, in some condition. Cognitive neuroscientists like me pretty much get into studies of, um, of people who have either a brain injury or neuroimaging within you know, similar populations or, or healthy individuals, um, or we'll do things like brain stimulation techniques. And uh, those are sort of the tools of the trade for us. And um, I think when you get into trying to study the human mind with an eye toward the brain or evidence from the brain, you start to think about, you know, how is the brain accomplishing something? And, and then you get into health states, so something like depression. Um, you mentioned some really interesting things about depression, that you have this internal narrative that's different than what others are seeing. And right, others are trying to tell you, hey, you know, it, I see you this way, mm -hmm. but something about it isn't believable to us because like, again, we're using our, our intuition that comes from somewhere in our brain and it mm -hmm. feels more real to us mm -hmm. because it's in our own heads. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think this is where um, talk therapies or just counseling or even just 
talking to close others can be so therapeutic and so beneficial. Mm -hmm. It's almost the only way out of this is to, to really share your ideas and get vulnerable with somebody and have them hear you and validate what you're feeling. And then when you're in that space, you, you can kind of maybe be receptive to when someone says, hey, you know, I actually see you this way and mm -hmm. I can present you with some actions you're doing, you know, or that you might do that, that would let you live to be the person you want to be. Um, I, I don't want to minimize neurochemistry here, though. You, you often do need meds. So meds are very helpful in this way because a lot of the um, depressive symptoms, it's not anyone's fault. It's just something that um, is happening within their mind. And it, some of the regulatory neurochemistry, if you can get... Um, a med to work for you, and dosing is very hard to do, um, it can be very effective. And that, uh, the combination of usually a pharmacological solution with some type of counseling mm. is the most powerful because it puts you sort of in the right brain state to then hear you know, something that would be beneficial to you to, to work on behaviorally. Right, yeah, and so I'll give my um, PhD from the street kind of point of view of, you know, just some of the things you just talked about. Um, obviously, you know, one of the things that we'll, we'll continue to discover on this podcast, um, in which I have kind of um, experimented, not in a, I've experimented in a, um, you know, in a kind of clinical way in, in my own life, right, is uh, psychedelics, right? So when you're talking about kind of getting other people's perspective on, you know, your thoughts, right? And the way that you reason, the way that you think. Um, you know, when I was depressed, I, I did six um, IV ketamine treatments. What ketamine is, it's a, it's a, it's a disassociative, disassociative anesthetic. So it disassociates you from your conscious reality. So for me, again, my conscious reality is very depressed, very self-deprecating, um, you know, just believing the lies that, you know, what I believe was, is um, how, the, how the devil gets a lot of people, right? Um, you know, thoughts in your brain that aren't true, but, but feel so real, right? And that um, ultimately just continue to fester and loop and tear you down. Um, so, but when I took ketamine, I was able to view my current reality, my current thought process from a different angle, as if like, I, you know, as if it was someone else um, looking at the way that I was currently thinking and I was able to reason with myself and be like, you know, those thoughts might not be true. Like, let's let's take a deeper look at why you think that way, right? And I came to the conclusions of like, hey, like, you know, for me, I was like, you've been doing all this for yourself, right? Not in memory of your brother, where it's like, in the actuality, like I gave up a high paying job and all these things and, you know, experienced so much stress and just to help other people through his legacy. Uh, I now know that to be tr actual truth. But in the moment, I thought, yeah, I was being selfish. And then I took it from a different perspective and was like, hey man, like, maybe that's not, reality, right? And maybe you should listen to other people who are telling you that you are a decent person, right? Who's doing this for other people. So it was just interesting as you say that, right? Into kind of, and I've been able to really reflect on, you know, um, psychedelic experiences and kind of, again, look at my past, my family's history of mental illness and, and certain things, right? And you know, my own ADHD and kind of my childhood and just all these certain things, right, that I never would have thought about in a million years without, you know, learning, but then also like viewing things from a different perspective. And so I think it's interesting kind of as you are describing how it works in psychology, right, why psychedelics might be um, uh, a promising treatment in the future with regulations and, and those sorts of things. Well, there's tremendous enthusiasm about psychedelics at this point point, which um, is probably a good thing because they, they were marginalized and sort of discounted for a long time. People would experiment with LSD or mushrooms and, and they would have sort of a, like a transformative experience that would report that. In fact, I, I just I can't help but think of this guy I knew back at Fredonia State who um, you know, did LSD and he was, um, he just became very zealous in and much more religious, and it's almost like a personality change, like a flip of a switch, because he'd been a very irreverent guy and kind of off color, and I was like, he really changed, and he was telling me about the experience, and um, he was just saying, you know, you have a very limited experience if you haven't done this. Right. You know, and, and those kind of reports are not unusual, um, which, you know, the remedy to the mystery around it is, of course, to, to look at it scientifically and to do, you know, 
um, trials on it in a in a, a rigorous way where you can get um, reliable sort of results that repeat over time. Replication is what we call that, which is so important. Um, and this is a good time to bring up my brain health credentials. So I I am at the Center for Brain Health in Dallas, which is um, a it's linked to the University of Texas at Dallas, but it's really its own thing. It's two buildings. Um, they're wonderful buildings. It is very much about health. You know, it's about the health of the human mind, and we use brain research as much as possible. And it's not a clinic, and that's an important thing. Most of what we do is a scientific study, or it's a program that's grown out of scientific studies. So an example would be uh, early when I came to Dallas, I got involved with um, Dr. Sandy Chapman, who's who's the the founder and the and the chief director, and I, I work with her um, on a variety of things. And she she was all about you know before other people were talking about brain health, she was really all about what does this do for our health? How can we address problems people have? And one of the first studies I got involved with um, with Sandy was doing this. Uh, it's called Charisma now, and it's a program using virtual avatars. Right, so this is this is familiar to everyone yeah, yeah. of current generations who's, who's done any gaming. Um, there's tremendous power in you know controlling a character and kind of being in social situations. And so we were thinking, well, why not do something, do simulations that are good for your health? <laughs> you know, so people that have social anxiety, people on the autism spectrum, uh, could practice social engagement in a virtual space using avatars that's much less threatening and very low stakes and they could be guided. And so we did um, some really uh, careful science on that and had some scientific papers that uh, were on autism and uh, gradually it moved into a program where now you can do um, you know, simulations for, for more social anxiety or, or just, or just learning, you know, just, just learning to do um, social engagement in a better way. And, it's also um, clinician guided, so there's another human on the. It's not a. It's not a, a digital character you're interacting with. It's actually a person on the other side of the avatar. So it's like a VR, um, <coughs> virtual reality type type thing. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. it's not so much about the graphics. The right. graphics make it immersive. It's about the other person, mm-hmm. right? And and you can do a simulation of a social activity. Um, and uh, t- to your earlier point about you, you have to be receptive to seeing yourself differently, um, you know, pharmacology is one way to get to that, right? It can somewhat unlock maybe the ability to see yourself through fresh eyes maybe. Yeah. Uh, but another thing that can do that is, is just a very helpful friend or counselor who can say, you know, here's what I'm seeing, you know, here's the evidence of it. You said this when I said that, that wasn't, you know, and then it went, you know, the interaction didn't go that well after that. And we can learn, right? And, and it's, it's actually kind of hard to learn socially because we're always just immersed in the social environment. We never, we never practice it. Right. So we're kind of left in society to make our own way and like try things out. And um, I think it's just a constant effort for all of us to then you know, generalize. What does this mean about me? What does it mean about the world? Um, and staying receptive to evidence is, is hard to do. Yeah. And so, so that's where I think pharmacology can be helpful here in psychedelics. Um, you do have these situations where somebody, there's just a change in their consciousness and that innate, that unlocks something that that's helpful to how they're going to function. Similarly, I think meditation has yeah. similar effects. Some people describe um, psychedelics as almost like um, a, a faster route to, Guaranteed route to, to meditative yeah, state, right, right, uh, right. but similar kinds of, uh, you know, me- meditation really is about, or mindfulness is really about consciousness. It's, it's actually focusing internally on consciousness and learning not to judge the situation or yourself, right. and, and that is not our natural state. <laughs> We're yeah. judgment machines. I mean, as a decision-making scientist, so much of our life is spent judging everything and trying to make a conclusion. It's just what we do. Yeah, of course. Um, man, this has been an amazing conversation so far. We're going to wrap it for this part one of the series, and then we will continue the rest of the discussion next week with Dr. Krasik. So thank you guys so much for listening today, and um, tune in next week for part two.